Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to the webinar. My name is Neeraj Kotian, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. I'm part of the customer interaction team at Quantum Mutual Fund. First of all, let me thank you all for taking out time on Wednesday evening and joining us for this session. We'll request everyone to use your headphones for better audio clarity. This session will have approximately 30 to 45 minutes of presentation, and then it will be followed by Q&A. You all can post your questions in the chat box once the presentation is over. As you all know, the topic for today's session is more reasons to buy gold this festive season. Gold, the word itself attracts most of us. It, in country like India, gold holds the sentiment values, especially during festivals and occasions. Gold is the, one of the most likable investment options due to its intrinsic value, its shine, and of course the sentiments connected with it, and so on. Hence today, our speaker will discuss why it is very important to build gold allocations, and they will answer questions like, what are the key reasons for investing in gold? Why is gold considered as a key asset class? Why one should allocate more gold surrounded this festive season, etc. Before we start, let me introduce our speakers for today's evening. The first speaker is our chief investment officer, Mr. Chirag Mehta, who has close to two decades of experience in managing commodities and specialized in the field of alternative investments strategies. He has been the fund manager for Quantum Gold Saving Fund, Quantum Equity Fund of Funds, Quantum Multi-Asset Fund of Funds, and Quantum India ESG Equity Fund. Our second speaker is Ms. Gazal Jain, who has over five years of experience in the field of finance and alternative investments, including gold, asset allocation, personal finance, and investment allocation. At present, she is the fund manager for Quantum Gold Fund ETF. She is with Quantum since January 2019. Without taking much time of yours, we'll request our speakers to take out the session. Over to you, Chirag. Thank you, Neeraj, and thank you everyone for joining on a Wednesday evening. Uh, I think uh, there will be much curiosity around uh, gold given we are entering a festive season, uh, whether to buy gold, uh, buy a token purchase or buy a larger quantity this season, is it a good time to do that? Uh, and how, to, how should one go about buying gold this season? So uh, before we jump into uh, looking at current scenario, which will decide whether you should, you know, increase your gold purchases this season or whether you go for a token purchase like what we have done every year and told you about what we see or how we see gold panning out over the next one, two, three years, and therefore uh, deciding on how you should go about buying gold. So before we do that, uh, we'll want to uh, highlight some basic factors. Uh, whenever you're looking at any investment per se, be it equity, be it bonds, be it gold, one thing paramount is that asset allocation is a key. There are many studies that have said that much of the variability in returns is generated by asset allocation and not what you own within that. So uh, if you look at time and again, years have gone and it is very difficult to predict what's gonna be the next best asset class. You don't know where the uncertainty is lurking from. You don't know, uh, you know what factors will influence how. No one predicted COVID. No one predicted global financial crisis. No one predicted Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, so things will happen, are bound to happen. Volatility will remain. And therefore, you need to asset allocate. When, when you asset allocate, uh, if you see the top line, uh, some years you have equity, some years you have gold, and some years you have bonds doing well. Uh, so it's it's been it's it's going to be very difficult to uh, say which which surety of course that which asset class is going to do well next year. So have a portion into uh, uh, all assets, and you could be uh, higher allocated to an asset which you think is going to do well. So if you look at 2022, despite many people thinking that gold has not given returns, gold has indeed given returns and it is better than other asset classes that we usually invest into. And whenever you invest in any asset class, uh, each and every asset is there for a reason. Uh, if equities are looking good, 
Should you put all your money into equities? The answer is no. Should you have a certain allocation to equities at all time? Answer is yes. Similarly, in each and every asset, you need to have certain allocation because there is a purpose behind which each and every asset class contributes to your portfolio. For example, equity is for long-term growth, uh, long-term returns that you generate over and above inflation that it helps you to generate. Debt is for regular income and stability. And gold is one of the best diversifies you have as an Indian investor. So uh, what we have recommended time and again, something that has worked over decades, uh, something has uh, worked over any kind of market scenario, be it a crisis period or be it a good market period, is a 12-20-80 formula. This, of course, you can customize based on what you think is better for you, but this could be a guiding tool in terms of how do you start with asset allocation. You need to have 12 months, minimum of 12 months of expenses, of your monthly expenses, parked safe into whatever you think is the safest place. Don't take risk with that kitty, be it a bank fixed deposit, be it a liquid fund does, that does not take risk. Uh, whatever you think is safe, you can put money there. And any money after that, you can split 80, 20, 80 into equities and 20 into gold. This is how you can you know, easily diversify. People say investment is complex. It's not so. It's very, very easy. And this tells you that it is indeed very easy, which works for different time horizons. And you can build the way your preferences are. You can build that asset allocation the way you want. You can either go the active way or the passive way. Uh, you can have 12 months of expenses, for example, in liquid fund. It's, it does not take any credit risk for, for example, a quantum liquid fund. You can have 12 months expenses parked there. Uh, 20 into gold, we think that gold funds or gold uh, mutual fund or gold ETFs are a better way to invest into gold. And then the equity portion can be active where you have 70% in equity fund of funds, 15% in ESG, 15% in long-term equity value fund. Or you go in the passive way where you have 85% large chunk in a nifty 50 ETF, fund of funds that's offered by quantum or and 15% in quantum India ESG equity fund. So you can choose whichever way you want it, but asset allocation is key. Uh, there is a dashboard on our website. You can use it to simply run your asset allocation and help you complete your journey towards asset allocation. So it's a very simple tool that we have built. You can choose active or passive like you see in this screen. You can select first to whichever way you want to go, active or passive and then it will give you options and you can tweak your options based on your preferences and your risk tolerance. So uh, as I said, it's very, very easy. This is how the dashboard looks like. Uh, you can easily toggle. If you think that 12 months of expenses are not enough, you can change that column to say 24 months, 36 months, depending on whatever you want. You can also change the allocation of 80, 20, uh, if you think you have to 80 into equity is more, I need to lower it. Or if you think I need to be more in gold, you can change those asset allocations and it will give you how much you should allocate in which fund and that completes your asset allocation journey. So coming back to gold, uh, first we'll uh, run you through a backdrop. What is the current global macro? Uh, because gold prices are influenced by what happens globally. Uh, it's a global asset. And therefore, what is the current backdrop influencing gold prices? So if you look at inflation, inflation certainly is still very high across the globe, be it the US market, be it the Europe inflation, be it uh, emerging market inflation. Uh, inflation has been significantly higher than what we have seen over the last 10, 20 years. So if you look at this chart since 2000s, until now, this has been the highest inflation the developed world at least has seen. Uh, India has seen inflation, which has been there, uh, and we have lived through such high inflation periods before. But if you look at the developed world, certainly this is one of the highest rates of inflation that, that's there. So higher inflation is usually better for gold because your interest paying deposits minus inflation yield you lower return or negative returns. And therefore, people move into uh, assets like gold from fixed income assets. So in higher inflation is usually leading to people to move into gold. Uh, as a response to high inflation, what central banks have done is increase uh, the uh, policy rates, increase the interest rates. 
And uh, when you increase the interest rate, it also leads to increasing yields. So if you look at on the left-hand side uh, graph, the blue line is the yields. So yields have moved up from where they were around 1.5, 1.6% in the US to about close to 4% now. And whenever yields increase, uh, somebody parking money in fixed deposits was getting around one and a half, two percent Now they are getting four, four and a half percent. So naturally there will be tendency to move something to on a real basis, they are still earning negative because inflation is at 8% and your uh, fixed in investment are yielding you 4%. But for some conservative investors, it will still make sense and they will kind of shift their money into these higher earning deposits on a relative basis, uh, what they were earlier and what they are now. So overall, this leads to some toll on gold. And that is what exactly we have seen. Rise, increase in yields has led to a fall in gold prices. Also, what happens is if the increase in yields in the US is more than any other developed economy like Europe, for example, then probably there is a shift in money that happens from U Europe to US or from UK to US. And that leads to strength in the dollar. Uh, because money is flowing into dollars, there's demand for dollar. And therefore, whenever dollar increases in value, we have seen gold prices go down. So that is shown in the right hand side graph where we see the blue line, which is moving up in terms of dollar strengthening. And if you see the green line, which is gold falling. So rising yields and rising dollar are taking a toll on gold prices. But despite these headwinds of rising yields, and rising dollar has not led to a significant dent in gold's appeal. So if you look at previous episodes, like what happened in 2013 or what happened during the uh, COVID period is where, where we saw uh, the US interest rates or US tips, uh, which is called as a real interest rate indicator uh, was moving up and gold was coming down. If you see the current move in US tips is from minus 1% to plus 2% roughly, uh, and still gold has held well relatively to what we have seen in previous episodes. So overall, uh, gold, despite the headwinds, is, uh, is still holding very well because of other reasons like the uncertainties on the geopolitical front or the inflation pressures that we are seeing is still leading to uh, gold remain in favor. So overall this year, uh, many think that gold has not given return, but if you put it relatively to other asset classes, it's the best of one of the best performing asset classes out there. So if you look at Sensex, this is for an Indian investor in INR, uh, Sensex is just a tad negative. Silver is minus 9%, something like Bitcoin is minus 60%. And if you look at bonds are just positive uh, at about half a percent. So gold for an Indian investor, has done or has performed to the way it should have performed. So it is positive in a period when other asset classes are negative or just tad positive. So that was the backdrop. There were some headwinds to gold and there were some positive factors that we are seeing that's helping gold. But what is in the future? What, how are gold prices gonna pan out in the future? And that should decide whether you buy a token purchase this Diwali or you buy a lump sum and complete your allocation to gold. So if you're under allocated, then you may want to buy a larger sum. So whether this is the right time to do that or not. So let's look at those reasons. There are five reasons that we'll take you through which are influencing gold and which will influence gold uh, and how are they gonna pan out going forward. So if you look at uh, the first reason, uh, that stock markets are indeed still vulnerable. Right? Indian economy looks set uh, to a positive trajectory. It's still robust uh, when it comes to growth as relative to other economies out there. But there could be shocks to stock markets out there because global interest rates are increasing. If you look at US interest rates have gone up from zero levels to close to 4% levels. So that tells you that if the cost of money goes up so, so significantly, there will be repercussions on financial markets out there. So this could lead to FIA outflows that could lead to stock market volatility. You have a stronger dollar because dollar uh, yields in US are increasing faster than other regions. And therefore you see a stronger dollar. 
and there, when there are uncertainties also, there's the flock of money moving to the dollar. So that could lead to rupee depreciation like what we have seen recently. Rupee has moved from 78, 79 levels to 82 levels over the last few months. Uh, and rupee depreciation is also on account of higher CAD that prevails. And that is also leading to erosion of forex reserves. We'll see that in detail in the next slides. Uh, also, there is geopolitical uncertainty like the Russia-Ukraine war or tensions on China-Taiwan. That could lead to higher, uh, more disruptions, higher energy cost, higher commodity cost, and that could lead to in imported inflation because energy or oil in India is largely imported. Uh, there are fears of a global recession, which we'll see in further slides as well, uh, which could lead to impact on our exports, and therefore that could lead to uh, some disruption on the growth front. Also, there is uh, uh, first signs given interest rates increasing so significantly, and given the amount of debt that prevails today in the global world, there could be a crisis that could get triggered, and that could lead to risk aversion, and also, therefore, uh, investments from foreign investors being curbed, and therefore, uh, another reason for stock market volatility. So there is India, which is better than the global world, but there could be, because we are, we are kind of better, but not really decoupled from the global world. And that could lead to stock markets being vulnerable. Moving on, uh, the second reason that we see uh, is that supply disruptions have so far caused uh, inflation concerns. And if you look at uh, what the central bank is doing, are increasing interest rates, tightening liquidity, which could lead to a collapse in demand. So they are trying to engineer a, a demand reduction such that supply and demand kind of balance out and therefore uh, uh, commodity prices or price of goods and services kind of come down. So if you look at, uh, there are there has been supply shocks because of COVID, because of zero uh, COVID policy in China, uh, because of what happened to the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, those pressures are easing. If you look at the blue bars, the peak supply disruptions are behind us and we have seen some easing of that, but you don't know how vulnerable we could be because you know, uh, there are still issues going with Russia and Europe, which could lead to you know, for, further energy market disruptions and that could again flare up inflation. There are tensions between Russia, uh, I mean, Taiwan and China. And there are certain uh, dialogues going on between US and China. So there could be further disruptions. And there is a wave of deglobalization, which could further lead to you know, rebuilding factories, demand for commodities uh, could increase. And therefore, uh, inflation could still rear its uh, uh, end and therefore be on a higher side again. So if inflation kind of uh, persists, then probably gold should do well. Uh, and if you look at the current inflation trends, uh, what we have seen in easing of commodity prices, but if you look at the other end of the spectrum, the second round effects, as we call it, uh, increase in goods, uh, in manufactured goods, and increase in services, increase in wages, etc., the full pass-through may not have happened. So uh, if you look at the wage growth, it's still very, very robust, in upwards of around 7-8% in the U.S., uh, and unemployment rate being so low uh, because people are not participating and not willing to come into the labor force and work, the unemployment rate still remains low because the denominator is not increasing because people uh, as a willingness to work, which is measured by the labor participation rate, is still very, very low. So overall, uh, that could lead to continued pressure on wages and salaries. Also, there is a measure called sticky inflation. So if you look at sticky inflation, it's still very, very high. It's at a 40-year high. And there could be further disruptions, as we spoke about previously, like deep globalization wave or transition from conventional to green energy that we see, uh, especially in Europe, that could further lead to impact on inflation. And if inflation continues to persist on a higher side, then probably it will help gold because no matter what the Fed does, by increasing interest rates and tightening liquidity, that could only kill demand, but it could not add to supplies. And if supplies continues to be disrupted, and there are second round effects of inflation that we have seen, uh, 
that could uh, really dent a blow on real interest rates, which is one of the driving force for gold. Third is the geopolitical tensions are still there. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, I mean, if you see last week, we saw a flare up in uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, there is again North Korea, which could be destructive. There are China-US tensions over Taiwan. Uh, so there are still many geopolitical risks lurking out in the global world, which could impact uh, supplies, which could inflect, impact inflation, which could increase the demand for gold, given it's an asset where people usually move in times of stress. So overall, uh, these geopolitical tensions can flow uh, further demand for gold. Uh, this is very, very important. What central banks are doing is trying to re-engineer growth to a level by slowing the economy so that demand slows down, which could lead to uh, uh, lower demand and lower demand could lead to lower inflation. This is what they are trying, but will they succeed? Usually in the past, they haven't. Uh, and there are many indicators saying that the demand has been slowing much more. Uh, as you see the US economy, technically there has been a recession. Uh, first quarter, we saw a shrinking of 0.9% in GDP growth followed by second quarter uh, drop of 1.6%. So overall, what we have seen is a technical recession. But when people say that, uh, given that unemployment is where it is, given the demand that we are seeing, it cannot be a recession. But we are seeing many signs, like you see the PMI, Purchaser, Purchasing Managers Index, it's below 50 and below 50 says it's into contraction. It's third consecutive month where it's been in contraction. If you look at the 10-year yield to two-year yield spread, whenever it goes below zero or negative, usually we've seen recessions follow a few months after that. And again, this has currently it has been into the negative territory. So this could also be a sign uh, that we could be staring at a recession. And there has been a recessionary uh, uh, trends seen across the globe. If you see China, if you see Eurozone, uh, they have been further significantly impacted. Eurozone because of high energy cost, high electricity cost, and China because of its COVID policies. So if you look at the IMF, IMF forecast, they have uh, revised the growth downwards to 3.2% uh, in 2022. And if you look at the next year uh, growth to 2023 and 2024, again, those growth uh, have also been revised downwards. So there are high, very high chances that the global world, given the central bank policies of lower liquidity, higher rates, higher inflation was already denting prospects, uh, there could be recession in the global world. And also, given that uh, what is happening in terms of, imagine the rates in the US increasing by 400 basis points or 4%. And given the period that we were in, we were in a period of very high liquidity and zero cost of money. Whenever we have seen such cycles, there usually have been a lot of malinvestments that take place. And given where we have reached in terms of uh, interest rates increasing by 4% lower liquidity, it's a complete sea change that we have seen. And therefore, these malinvestments that would have happened during such time of euphoria could unravel in these times of high liqu tighter liquidity and higher cost of money. So overall, uh, there could be financial stress that could increase and there could be financial stability concerns. So if you look at the OFR financial stress index, it's already high than what it was previously. Also, if you look at the debt levels in the global world, it had mostly now it is at the government level. Uh, it's all these areas which are marked in dark color are all debt to GDP ratios of more than 100%. So these governments also will not be able to tolerate very high levels of uh, GDP, uh, uh, interest rates that, that could happen because their debt levels are very, very high. 
also if you see uh, the last reason that we see is the downward pressure on the rupee given that our exports may decline because of uh, export low being lower because of uh, the stress in the global world like if there is a global recession demand for exports will go down and therefore our exports may go down that could increase our current account deficit and fundamentally whenever current account deficit increases if there are new flows coming in from foreign investors that could lead to a depreciation in the rupee so also what rbi is trying to do is slow down the volatility of rupee depreciation so they are uh, trying to slow down the pace at which rupee depreciates and therefore they are intervening in uh, in the uh, forex markets uh, so that there is lesser volatility or there is lesser uh, uh, fall in the rupee being seen in a shorter time span and that is eroding the forex reserves also there has been some revaluation which has led to erosion of forex reserves because if you see much of the debt is much of the forex holding is in us treasuries or us debt markets and whenever we have seen that increase in yields that have happened there could be a revaluation of forex reserves and therefore we have seen the forex reserves come down so rupee could depreciate further uh, because of uh, fundamental factors like uh, higher current account deficit and that could lead to again an increase in uh, gold prices because inr depreciation adds to gold price return so net net what are we staring at is if you look at near term given the headwinds that we are seeing from higher interest rate increases stronger dollar the uh, gold prices could remain range bound like what we have seen over last few months so if you look at there has been a range of 1600 1900 uh, on either side and gold kind of prevailed in that range uh, so uh, downsides from here because much of the interest rate increases are kind of baked in markets are already factoring in downsides could be limited of course there will be knee jerk reactions whenever the fed increases rates but uh, beyond that we don't see much impact uh, what are the positives what's working for gold which will help it in the medium to long term is uh, high inflation if it kind of persists it will help gold there is a very high concern on economic slowdown recession uh, there are geopolitical tensions out there uh, there could be potentially uh, some form of crisis be it debt currency or any other uh, and weaker rupee if rupee weakens further from here that could add to gold price returns so there are three fact three scenarios that we could be staring at right uh, we'll tell you which scenario we think is more probable one is uh, where the growth suffers a lot but inflation continues to persist uh, because we have seen whenever growth collapses unless there are more supply disruptions more impact on uh, uh, on uh, uh, energy costs etc because of say tensions increasing in us china because china is a big supplier to the global world and if there are sanctions like what we've seen in Russia on China, that could lead to inflation to be more stickier and growth coming down significantly. That's what we call a stagflationary scenario. If that were to happen, then gold should do well. A second scenario, which looks more probable, where there is a slowdown in the global world because of tightening uh, that the central banks are doing, uh, there could be more money chasing goods amid supply chain disruptions. Uh, that is where you know uh, a scenario where growth slowdown compels the central bank to take a u-turn in their policy so what they are saying today because say if growth collapses completely and inflation kind of subdues a bit then they will take a u-turn in their policy to support growth at that point in time and if that were to happen it will erode some credibility of the central banks because inflation if still it is higher beyond their tolerance level and growth collapses and they kind of jump in to save growth then in that scenario uh you know inflation could run up again because of more money being pumped in by central banks uh and that is a goldilocks scenario for gold uh so if that were to happen gold should uh, reprice and move much higher and third is a scenario where we call it a soft landing where you know fed kind of recalibrates the economy so finely that you know growth comes down so much to bring the inflation down 
but growth is still still okay and it, it does not be, become a big dent and inflation comes down significantly. If that were to happen, then gold will suffer. But we have seen time and again when the central banks start um, taking actions, they usually do it in a rear view mirror. They are not very, very forward looking. And whenever uh, such thing happens, they kind of tighten uh, too much that the economy suffers much rather than impacting inflation. So soft landing isn't easy uh, and a low probability scenario as of now. Uh, scenario two luck looks much, much probable and scenario one is a little less likely but cannot be ruled out. So uh, what we have seen, why I was saying that, you know, uh, central banks can take a U-turn that probably is a more probable scenario because we have seen time and again, uh, whenever growth starts suffering and financial instability increases, central banks jump in. And whenever central banks jump in, take a U-turn, they will do take more unconventional measures, more aggressive measures in their policy. They will pump in a lot of money. They'll cut interest rates drastically. And that is a scenario where some of the credibility gets eroded. Uh, the dollar strength that we are seeing today gets eroded. Uh, the real interest rates, which we are seeing inching up higher, gets eroded. And therefore, whatever factors drive gold become more positive for gold, and gold should do well in such scenario. One recent example that we saw for that is Bank of England. Uh, there was a instability in UK markets, uh, UK pension market, uh, where rising yields led to disruption in uh, in the pensions because pensions had bought a lot of structured products and they were getting margin calls because of yields moving higher. And at that very moment, uh, Bank of England suddenly jumped in saying that we are there, we'll support the markets with liquidity. Uh, nothing wrong in that, but you know that gives you the attitude that central banks have towards financial markets and instability. So whenever there will be a growth scare, whenever there will be a impact on uh, financial markets, probably central banks will take a U-turn. And this is what we have seen uh, time and again. So if you look at whenever uh, the boxes that we have marked, whenever there have been interest rate increases, that had led, led to a growth uh, slowing down. And whenever the growth slows down, we have seen uh, feds and other central banks jumping in saying that we will support the markets. So if that were to happen, gold should reprice going forward. And uh, with a longer term view, I think this could be a good time to add gold to your portfolio. So don't restrict yourself with a token purchase. If you're under allocated to gold, you should buy gold uh, this festive season. Uh, maybe there could be some downside. Some downside cannot be ruled out. But again, uh, there could be rewards if there were things to unravel in the global world. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to my colleague Gazil, who will take you uh, to see gold from a lens that it is indeed an important asset class. It is a strategic asset class and why you should hold, hold gold, how you should hold gold, and how much you should hold gold. So with that, uh, Kazil, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chirag. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, in the first part of the presentation, we have seen uh, the macroeconomic backdrop uh, that is uh, prevailing currently and how gold will be a relevant asset class for your portfolio in this scenario. But I'm also here to remind you that irrespective of how the macroeconomic scenario develops, you know, uh, what risks uh, uh, actually unravel or not, gold is a strategic asset class, an asset class that deserves to be a part of your portfolio, you know, no matter what. So uh, let me just uh, run you through some of the reasons for that. So number one, uh, gold is a source of long-term returns, right? So gold, if you see historically, it is driven by a number of factors and drivers, uh, two of them being economic expansion and risk and uncertainty, right? So because gold is so diverse, its uses come from you know, a lot of avenues. So in times of economic expansion, for example, 
demand for gold comes in the form of jewelry demand or you know demand in technology and electronics industries on the other hand when there's risk and uncertainty demand for gold can come from investors you know who are looking to diversify their portfolios uh, and demand can also come from central banks again who are also looking to diversify their balance sheets so uh, in good times and bad we have seen that gold has generated long term positive returns and um, the reason being you know this this diverse source of demand for gold and this is what actually differentiates it from other investment uh, assets so you know in this graph if you can see we've tried to plot uh, the returns of gold and other uh, asset classes over 3 5 and 7 year periods and in this period as you're aware we have seen a uh, lot the economy has seen a lot of ups and downs good times and bad um, you know the covid-19 pandemic and the expansion that followed and now the russia ukraine war so it has been a very you know um, uh, a mix of uh, good and bad times right and through that you can see the green bar uh, that is uh, gold actually has given upwards of 10% returns cagr right which is uh, obviously below equities as an asset class but you know uh, it has performed and given good returns over the long term uh moving on to the other reason why gold is a strategic asset class is that gold is a portfolio diversifier right so if you see this uh, graph uh, on the left uh, we've tried to plot the returns of gold versus bonds and equities on a year to date basis that is in 2022 and on a one year basis uh the purple uh, bars are the you know are representative of equity markets and you can see that they have given negative returns in 2022 and on a one year basis and gold on the other hand has you know managed to give positive returns in this period right so we have seen that when stock markets go through periods of stress gold you know uh, because of its uh, negative correlation you know tends to do well now that you know that is when that is its true utility in terms of you know being a portfolio diversifier so instead of having an all equity portfolio if you did have gold you know e even through this this uh, volatility that we've seen through 2022 uh, you would have been much better off uh, you know with that allocation to gold just to give you an insight into you know the correlation between the different asset classes uh, you see the table on the right you can see that gold and uh, um, equity markets are negatively correlated this period is of course from september 2020 to september 22 we've taken this as a reference period because of the volatility that markets have seen and you can see that gold and equities are uh, indeed uh, negatively correlated uh the number 3 uh, the number third reason that uh, gold is a strategic asset is that it is a store of value or it is you know the preserver of purchasing power uh, we all know that inflation you know is a real challenge every year inflation eats into uh, you know the purchasing power of our money you know with the same amount of money the next year we can buy fewer things right that's what cost of living or higher inflation means now how does gold actually help in this scenario so uh over the long term uh, it changes in the money supply drive the price of gold and it is believed that because of this increased supply of fiat currencies fiat currencies as in rupee dollar uh you know because of their increased supply compared to the fixed supply of gold you know uh gold tends to kind of preserve your purchasing power right it is viewed as an alternative monetary asset and that is why in periods of high inflation gold tends to do well so in this graph what we've done is um uh we've tried to map out you know over a 40 year period uh the returns that gold have given compared to inflation so in periods of high inflation uh, where inflation was more than 6% gold gave nominal returns of 12% uh, but adjust that for inflation and they gave returns of about 2% uh which is positive which means that gold gave you more returns than inflation and gold managed to you know uh keep your wealth intact and in fact grow your money and even in periods of low inflation when you know inflation was less than 6% gold gave a positive or a real rate of return of 0.77% so uh you know this really highlights uh, the utility of gold in your portfolio in in terms of uh you know as a store of value or as a preserver of purchasing power uh and that is why uh, you know because of these characteristics of gold uh 
this this strategic utility that gold brings to the portfolio uh, we we recommend about 15 to 20 percent allocation to gold uh, so at quantum we did this analysis where uh, we tried to see you know uh, by adding gold to an equity portfolio you know uh, what was the utility uh, that uh, an investor can derive and as you can see uh, at this number of 85 percent equity and 15 percent gold uh, go, uh, the portfolio managed to give 14% returns, which was in line with, say, a 100% equity portfolio, right? So there was no compromise on returns. But at the same time, this portfolio, an 85-15 equity gold portfolio, managed to reduce the risk uh, from 20% to 17%. And also the maximum drawdown uh, in, of such a portfolio was 52% compared to 60%. So this is the kind of um, you know, utility gold drinks to the table. And that is why this 15 to 20% uh, number is actually where you know, gold can play a risk reducing, return enhancing role for you. And uh, so uh, anything more than that actually tends to be counterproductive and anything less than that could, you know, will not maybe meaningfully reduce your risk. So uh, now we've spoken about the macro environment. We've uh, discussed how gold is a strategic asset. Now, even after investors are convinced about this, you know, that gold is a good asset class to be in, what's very important is how you invest in gold, right? So we're going to talk about how you can optimize your gold investments. Now, uh, we as Indians uh, have been investing in gold for, you know, generations. Um, all of us have... Uh, some sort of allocation to gold, right? But most of it is physical, uh, gold coins, bars, uh, and uh, majority of the times it's jewelry. So we have this preference for physical gold. Now, uh, there, there are no issues with physical gold, but the question that actually comes up is with the kind of, you know, uh, uh, purity concerns uh, that, you know, surround physical gold, uh, the smuggling that is rampant in the country, uh, you know, does it really make sense to arc your long-term money or does it does it make sense to consider physical gold as an investment avenue, right? Uh, so uh, it's very important that we differentiate between consumption and investment, gold consumption and gold investment. And for that, we've tried to map out for you, uh, you know, very simply, the various uh, gold uh, investment avenues that are available to investors today so that you can take an informed decision about uh, you know where you want to uh, invest your hard-earned money for your gold exposure so just to quickly take you through these uh, we've considered the four uh, main avenues uh, that are available currently physical gold digital gold sovereign gold bonds and gold etfs so uh, all the uh, three, uh, all avenues except for sovereign gold bonds are backed by physical gold. Um, now, uh, even though sovereign gold bonds, you know, they're, they're not backed by physical gold, they do come with a sovereign guarantee. Uh, but there are some investors who prefer the backing of physical gold for their investments because uh, gold uh, as an asset class, you know, is, is not uh, anyone's uh, liability. And when uh, it is in this form, where it's not backed by physical gold, but it's backed by a guarantee, it kind of changes its characteristics. So some investors are not comfortable with that. And uh, that, that is, uh, it, it's a valid uh, justification. Uh, of course, coming to storage and safety, uh, with physical gold, that is an issue. There's always a risk of theft and there are locker and vault uh, charges that are you know uh, involved. In case of uh, the other three financial avenues, digital gold and gold bonds and ETFs, uh, you know, uh, they're stored in vaults on behalf of you. So the investor has no risk. And in, in case of sovereign gold bonds, uh, of course, uh, there is no gold backing it. So there is no risk of theft. Coming on to the most important thing here, uh, which I touched upon earlier, is purity. With physical gold, uh, purity is never guaranteed. It's, it's always a concern, you know, even with hallmarking, uh, which is a very good move coming up. Uh, a lot of the country is still not covered under it, and there are, uh, you know, um, question marks on how genuine the hallmarking is. So, so with physical gold, you know, uh, like jewelry, that will always be a question mark, right? In terms of the other three avenues, of course, purity is not an issue. Uh, gold ETFs, for example, they invest only in 24 karat gold, so you can be assured of that. 
Moving on to the price efficiency, which is the second most you know important feature of a good investment. Uh, physical gold. Uh, first of all, the first thing is making charges. We land up paying fifteen to twenty percent making charges on our jewelry, uh, even on the coins and bars, right? So that's a direct uh, expense that you land up paying, and that really eats into your returns. Uh, we don't take this into account, but uh, this is really inefficient and really eats into your long-term returns. Also, um, as an investor or as a purchaser, when you go and buy physical gold, you pay 3% GST right, on it. Uh, but at the same time, if you have to go sell that physical gold, you do not get a credit for that 3% GST. So that also adds to your costs. right? Similarly, in digital gold, uh, we've seen uh, because you know the consumer is the last uh, last uh, leg of this whole cycle. They do not get any GST credit at the time of selling their digital gold units. Uh, but of course they have to pay it when they are buying it. And also um, it, it has been observed that there's a, uh, there's a spread of a significant spread in the buying and selling price of uh, you know, digital gold offerings. Uh, of course, GST plays a role in that and other reasons. So if you buy something, uh, buy digital gold right now and you decide to sell it just like five minutes later, there's going to be a spread of about three to five percent. So you're losing three to five percent within minutes of you know, buying something. So that's where uh, digital gold tends to be inefficient. Uh, sovereign gold bonds uh, on the price efficiency front are good in the sense that you know they give you 100% replication of gold returns. Uh, but uh, uh, something that is an issue with sovereign gold bonds is that uh, their secondary market liquidity is low, right? Which is uh, if you want to buy and sell, you know, the sovereign gold bond on the exchanges. Right, most probably they are trading at a discount to their fair price, a uh, discount that could range anywhere uh, from five to fifteen percent. So that is something investors don't take into account when they, you know, uh, think about sovereign gold bonds. They look at the other benefits, but this is something they should keep in mind. And lastly, gold ETFs. Uh, gold ETFs have expense ratios and a small tracking error, but everything, all of this, uh, is less than one percent which is a very uh, small cost compared to the other avenues, right? Also, because gold ETFs buy uh, their gold in bulk, you know, they get the benefit of wholesale prices and that benefit is passed on to the investor. So, you know, uh, even though you're buying a unit, just one unit of a gold ETF, which is 0 0.01 grams, you're not going to get the retail price for that. You're going to get, you know, a cheaper price because of the wholesale benefits that the gold ETF can pass on to you. Uh, another uh, area where G gold ETFs actually um, are more efficient is the GST credit. So uh, because uh, gold ETFs are passed through vehicles, uh, they pay GST when they purchase gold, but they also get the offset or the credit when they sell gold, right? So this benefit or you know the saving that uh, arises here compared to the other avenues is also passed on to the investor. And uh, gold ETFs are tradable on the exchanges. And if you see, there's a very thin difference between buying and selling price. Uh, gold ETFs try to keep their buying and selling price very close uh, on the exchange. So there is no uh, impact cost you know, uh, involved there. Um, moving on to the interest paid, um, out of the four avenues, only sovereign gold bonds uh, pay an interest of 2.5% per annum. Uh, coming to the taxation, um, Physical gold, digital gold, and gold ETFs are taxed similarly, uh, with, where uh, gains that are less than three years are taxed at marginal tax rate, and those above three years are taxed at 20% post-indexation. For sovereign gold bonds, if you hold the bonds till maturity, uh, you don't have to pay any capital gains tax, but the maturity period is eight years, which tends to be very long. Realistically, you know, most people would have shorter investment horizons. And in that case, the similar tax rate that is applicable to uh, the other three are applicable to sovereign gold bonds. Also, another uh, drawback of sovereign gold bonds is that they come with a lock-in period. So um, if you want to sell uh, the sovereign gold bond back to, uh, uh, you know, the issuing authority or to the bank, uh, there's a lock-in period of five years. Right before that, you're not, you're not, you you cannot sell it, but you can sell it on the exchange. Uh, physical gold, as you are aware, and digital gold, and also gold ETFs have no such lock-in period. 
coming to the liquidity, uh, physical gold, of course, very liquid, good digital gold as well. Uh, gold ETFs also have high uh, liquidity, even on the exchanges here. But uh, sovereign gold bonds, like we discussed, have lower secondary market liquidity. Uh, accessibility, uh, all the three avenues, very easy. They can be bought and sold, you know, uh, whenever. Like gold ETFs can be bought and sold on the exchange using DMAT account during market hours, uh, and they're very accessible. You can buy gold for as low as 0 0.01 grams, right? Uh, sovereign gold bonds, on the other hand, um, they're only available when, you know, tranches are announced, So and that also for a limited period. So uh, that kind of really reduces their ac accessibility. Uh, physical gold delivery is the next aspect. So uh, in, uh, digital gold gives you that option. Gold ETFs also give you that option uh, uh, in line with regulatory limits, which as of now is you can take uh, delivery of physical gold in lots of one kg. Sovereign gold uh, uh, bonds do not give you that option. Um, moving on to the next part, which is regulation. This is what I want to highlight here. Uh, of course, sovereign gold bonds are backed by sovereign guarantee. Uh, but out of the other three, gold ETFs are the only uh, investment avenues that are insured as well as regulated. Digital gold, uh, as of now, has no regulator. And similarly, there is no regulator for physical gold. So in summary, uh, taking all of these features uh, you know, into account, uh, we feel that physical gold and digital gold are ideal for consumption. Right. When you want to buy jewelry, when you want to, um, uh, you know, park your savings for a while and then maybe convert that into a gold coin. So uh, for consumption purposes, physical gold and digital gold are good avenues. But if you are considering gold for an investment purpose, then you should be looking at sovereign gold bonds and gold ETFs. And within that, if liquidity is important to you, you know, to be able to uh, exit your investment whenever you want uh, and you know not having to exit at a discount you know so that you can exit at fair prices um, if you want that kind of convenience then gold ETFs actually score above sovereign gold bonds so uh, often uh, I mean we discussed that gold ETFs are very good uh, price efficient secure insured regulated avenues but uh, just I want to quickly touch upon what gold ETFs are just uh, so that we're clear, right? So these are investment vehicles that invest in 24 karat physical gold, right? What they try to do is they want to track the price of gold and generate returns in line with the returns of gold, right? Now, uh, even though they're financial, you, you know, you have that uh, comfort that each and every ETF unit is backed by physical gold, 24 karat physical gold, right? Um, now, just as shares represent uh, the extent of equity ownership in a company, your units, gold ETF units, represent your ownership in the ETF's gold, right? Because the ETF buys gold and that is its underlying asset. Every unit of the ETF that you hold represents your ownership in that underlying gold, right? And just like you can buy and sell shares on the exchange, you can buy the gold ETF, buy and sell gold ETFs units also on the exchange. So uh, in short, they combine the flexibility of stock investment and the simplicity of gold investments. Um, and the logical extension to gold ETFs are gold mutual funds. Now, uh, mutual fund investors who prefer the mutual fund route you know, of investing in gold, they can opt for gold mutual funds. Um, so gold mutual funds just invest in the gold ETF, which in turn invest in the underlying physical gold. Um, gold mutual funds have all the benefits of gold ETFs, um, but in addition, you do not need a DMAT account, right? You can you can just go to the mutual through the mutual fund route instead, and also you have the option of doing a, a, a SIP, so you you can systematically invest in gold with you know as little as rupees five hundred per month, and it's open twenty four seven. Because gold ETFs are such you know. Uh, price efficient and uh, regulated uh, avenues for gold uh, investment. We've seen that, you know, they have been gaining traction. There has been a lot of uh, interest uh, in gold ETFs, um, you know, over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, folios have increased, you know, to about 14 lakh plus folios and um, uh, assets under management in this category are now close to 20,000 crore. So as, uh, uh, you know, more and more investors are recognizing um, the utility and uh, the benefits of this investment avenue, this, uh, this, this investment avenue is, you know, really picking up.
So uh, coming to the quantum gold ETF, you know, uh, we've discussed what gold ETFs are and what uh, benefits they bring to the table. So why should you choose quantum gold ETF? Uh, apart from the purity and price efficiency, uh, you know, uh, that uh, we offer, uh, the, the fund is completely passively managed. We do not try to time the market uh, or take a call on gold prices because we have such a long-term and strategic uh, view uh, you know, towards gold. Uh, someone who also looks at gold in, in that sense can you know, really uh, benefit from investing with us. Uh, we have you know, one of the lowest tracking errors in the industry. Um, the quality of our underlying gold, uh, like I said, each unit of the quantum gold ETF is backed by 24 karat uh, gold. Um, each of these bars is sourced from LBMA accredited refiners. We import them only through authorized banking channels. Um, all the gold of the ETF is stored in professional vaults, right? Uh, the gold is regularly audited and physically verified. And uh, Quantum is, uh, I think, one of the only fund houses that also undertakes a purity test, uh, you know, regularly of the gold that is held by the fund, right? And lastly, in addition to the high-level security storage, um, we also have a very comprehensive insurance in place for further safety of investors' capital. So investors can, you know, be assured uh, that the gold backing their Quantum Gold ETF units is pure gold. Uh, so with that, I come to the end of the presentation. Uh, so what, you know, uh, what do we do? What should investors do currently, you know, given where gold prices are? So like, like we discussed, there are a lot of risks on the horizon. So volatility in financial markets, uh, you know, is expected to continue for the next few months. And because of that, it will be a challenging period for all asset classes, equities, bonds, currencies, and even gold to some extent. But, you know, um, equities and bonds are risk assets. So they have the, you know, potential to suffer more and gold could be relatively better place. It could uh, do better in this scenario. So for investors who already have a 15 to 20% allocation to gold, uh, uh, you don't need to do anything. You should just, uh, uh, Stay put and watch gold play a risk-reducing return enhancing role for your portfolio. And those who are yet to allocate 20% of gold, um, you know, given that gold prices are near uh, two-year lows and downside from here looks limited, now can be a good uh, time for investors to start accumulating gold, right? Um, so in the 12-20-80 framework um, that Chirag spoke about at the beginning, 20% of your allocation can go to either the quantum gold ETF or the quantum gold savings fund so that your asset allocation uh, needs are met. Um, with that, uh, I think we've come to the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, over to you, uh, Neeraj.
Thank you, Chirag and Gazal, for the insightful presentation. We'll request all our listeners to continue to post their questions in the chat box. In the meantime, we have received few questions via email uh, before the webinar, as well as from the chat box as well. So we'll start with that. Uh, Chirag, my first question to you, uh, like with interest rate rising, the US Fed looking to continue, the, uh, continue with their rate hikes and the US dollar strengthening, do all these points towards uh, gold price dipping in the near future? If as in how much uh, downside do you expect from here on? No, sure. That's a very valid question. Uh, we touched upon certain aspects in our presentation, but I'll reiterate those points. Uh, so what we are seeing in the global world is uh, much of uncertainty regarding two big factors. One is growth and one is uh, inflation. Uh, inflation is, is more supply side driven. And if there is more disruption to inflation, probably it may continue to be more sticky than what we thought. Second is, uh, if you look at the aggressiveness of central banks, uh, will likely to persist for a few more months at least, because they are looking at the rear view mirror currently and seeing that inflation prints are coming hot. Because if you see much of the inflation started coming from February onwards when the Russia-Ukraine conflict started, right? So until Jan, Feb, we will see that inflation continues to persist on a higher number uh, and unlikely to soften much more or soften significantly, and which will lead the aggressiveness from central banks to continue. So uh, I think they will end up uh, placing a much more uh, dent on growth uh, than they would have expected. And therefore, there will be some time uh, into next year where they will pivot uh, and take a U-turn in their policies and uh, increase their aggressiveness on the other side of the spectrum. So they, what they are doing today is tightening liquidity, cutting interest rates. They will do opposite when, the, when there is a growth scare, there is instability in financial markets. Uh, they will start uh, doing it much more aggressively. So that is where we expect gold to reprice. So till that time frame, uh, uh, gold should remain range bound. I think the downsides will clearly be limited uh, because there is inflation that will su support the sentiments. Second is there will be, uh, there is a lot of demand that we're seeing from Asian or emerging market economies like China, Turkey, et cetera. Uh, which is going to support gold or provide a floor to gold prices, uh, which we have seen a time and again happen. So wherever there is a price dip, these emerging market buyers, because of their cultural affiliation or because of uh, certain issues with their own economies, like what we're seeing in China today, uh, what we are seeing in Turkey today, very high inflation numbers, et cetera, is leading them to buy a lot more gold. So overall, I think gold will be well supported and therefore downsides from here on could happen, but will be limited. I think something that investors will be able to live with. So an allocation to gold at this time looks much uh, better given the risk reward dy dynamics that we're staring at. So risk looks limited, uh, rewards whenever there is a, a U-turn in Fed policies or we see a stagflationary scenario both could lead to supporting gold significantly and gold should do start doing well. So when that will happen, how that will play out is difficult to say, but we see either of those two scenarios playing out over next six months to one year. And therefore, uh, uh, it will be better to have an allocation to gold rather than regret uh, uh, given the uncertainties in the global financial markets. So uh, I think it's a good time to have an allocation given the risk reward looks in favor of growth. Thanks, Chirag. Uh, Chirag, next question is with debt rally happening currently, why not debt or bond funds making more sense now to catch up the rally of an increasing interest rate cycle hike with the yields going up? No, certainly we have seen yields moving up, uh, but have we seen peak yields? Probably may, may not. It will depend on how inflation pans out in India and therefore RBI's need to uh, further increase rates. Uh, given US with high rates, there will be pressure on RBI to increase rates further. So, uh, so we may have not seen peak rates. Maybe there could be some more uh, pressure on yields. The yields could go up slightly more from what we have seen. Uh, second, uh, we are not saying that you know you should invest in gold in place of bonds. You need to have an allocation to debt because there is a role that debt plays in your portfolio and there is a role that gold plays in your portfolio. 
like for example if you look at last one year or this ytd this 2022 year go, gold has been a better diversifier than bonds have been uh, so we have seen that equity and debt or bonds can decline together which is what has happened for much of this year whereas gold is one asset that has held its value so you need gold as a diversification and debt if you understand debt then only venture into debt because debt can also have negative returns understand that so if yields were to go up from here debt funds could give you negative returns so you have to understand and live with that fact it's not a replacement to a fixed uh, yielding a deposit which will not go negative so what investors have to understand and there is a place for both so incrementally you could go into debt but again I, as i said if things were to go sour then gold will be a much protect much better protector of value as compared to debt so i think uh, you should have an allocation to all three asset classes and gold has its own unique play cannot be replaced by debt Thanks, Shira. Uh, as we spoke about diversification, uh, Gadil, next question to you. Uh, in the current market environment, what role does a gold play in an investor's portfolio? Is it time to increase the gold allocation? Um, yeah. While, while Indian equities you know, are well-placed with strong fundamentals and attractive valuations, um, uh, like Chirag mentioned, they are vulnerable you know, to the monetary policy tightening and a global economic slowdown. So investors must be cautious. Um, also, as recessionary and you know, geopolitical risks increase, investment, investors must be focused on uh, risk management uh, more than return generation. So they may want to shift to you know, more defensive strategies and look for high quality liquid assets such as gold, which can cushion their portfolios from the equity market volatility. And uh, whether it's a, a, the right time to increase allocation to gold, uh, like I said, 20% of your portfolio to gold it's a good starting point. Uh, and since prices have considerably corrected at these levels, uh, under allocated investors can start accumulating in a staggered manner. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, when prices move higher, there will be a sizable upside for them. Thank you. Uh, Chirag, uh, one, next question to you. Uh, why investors should look at the gold as an investment option and not platinum, as platinum is most precious, although non lustrous? Yeah, if you see last many years, uh, what we've seen is uh, uh, that platinum has lost its luster to some extent or lost its shine because uh, platinum is largely used in uh, automobiles uh, as a usage. And uh, given that we are uh, moving towards, you know, it's become more efficient. It's some, some way replaced by palladium. It's some way uh, when we go to the EV world, there will be no use of platinum because uh, those who are non-emission um, uh, non emission producing vehicles and therefore uh, the usage of platinum will decline significantly. So platinum was at one point in time was significantly more expensive than gold. And if you see last many years, because of uh, what's happened to the demand front, the outlook on demand has worsened and therefore platinum now quotes much lower than what gold is and i think uh, uh, platinum will continue to slide from a demand perspective so i think whenever you look at uh, diversification uh, choose gold because gold if you look at even central banks allocate to gold right and gold has proven time and again uh, that it's it kind of uh, increases in value when there is stress in the financial world so it's a much proven asset so rather than venturing into fancy things like platinum, I think people should or investors should kind of stick to the time-tested allocation like gold. Uh, uh, issues with many commodity plays like palladium, platinum, etc., is that one is it is uh, it is uh, dependent on the vagaries of demand supply. Firstly, so if demand collapses, then prices will fall. Second, if uh, there is a big substitution risk when it comes to such kind of commodities, which are more industrial used rather than used as an investment. So I think uh, when it comes to your portfolio, please remain with gold and not even things like silver, platinum, palladium, because silver, platinum, palladium are all industrially used commodities. 
50, 70, 80% of uses of such commodities comes from industrial purposes and they will do well when your economy is doing well. And that exposure you already get through your equity. So it does not diversify. It increases your risk because it moves in tandem with economic growth through which your equities will also uh, move. And therefore, uh, gold is a better diversifier and, and not things like silver, platinum, and palladiums. So I think uh, bottom line, stick to gold as an allocation to offer your portfolio. Thanks, Chirag. Uh, Chirag, one more question. Do Indian needs... Indians need to be told or advised to invest in gold. Then historically, it's been a part of our asset allocation in every family across economic class or status, et cetera. Uh, no, uh, the Indians are natural buyers of gold. They have been big buyers of gold years through. But uh, we see things changing in some uh, to some extent, right? Uh, one is... Uh, there have been certain traits to our gold buying which shouldn't continue. For example, we have been used to buying physical gold always, right? And that is because regulations were such. Uh, prior to 98, I think uh, you, you were only able to buy jewelry. You were not even able to buy coins and bars. To some extent, there was a gold control act which kind of prohibited even ownership of bars and coins for a very long time illegally many were able to buy but uh, officially it was not permitted uh, in, in in terms of form of ownership and that tradition or that habit of buying jewelry uh, to buy gold has continued despite efficient forms of buying gold have emerged like gold uh, mutual funds gold etfs etc emerged with a very very price efficient vehicles Jewelry from a buying perspective for investment is the worst form of buying as an investment because uh, even if you're accumulating gold, what many people do is accumulate gold in small quantities, exchange it for a bigger item uh, when they accumulate sizable amount of smaller things. Right? Whenever uh, there is a thumb rule which says that, you know, three to three and a half times, you kind of change your jewelry piece for a, another jewelry piece, you lose your initial investment. So that really tells you or sums up that it is one of the worst forms of investments out there because you lose each time you buy, you eat, lose each time you sell. And that's not a good investment for, from any counts. So gold ETFs at the other end helps investors buy even 0.01 grams of gold at prices at which a gold producer is selling to a bullion bank. So that wholesale efficiency, where tons and tons of gold get exchanged, it translates from that wholesale level to a very retail level. And therefore, investors don't need to be told about to buy gold or not. Of course, there are questions each time uh, uh, that emerge in heads of people that whether I should just buy for token, buy a few, uh, one or two grams of gold, or should I, I am under allocated a gold, should I buy more? So this, this we are holding the session to tell them that, you know, what are the prospects so that they can take an educated call, an informed decision on what kind of gold, how much to purchase and how should that purchase. To leave out the old, old habits of buying inefficient forms of gold towards buying efficient forms of gold. And that's our objective of today's session. Thanks, Shirad. Uh, Gazal, next question to you. Does gold hold any return enhancing potential or is it just a mitigate risk? Right. Uh, so, I mean, I think if we go to slide 26, uh, we spoke about, you know, uh, the various drivers uh, of gold prices, right? Economic expansion, risk and uncertainty. Uh, there's also opportunity cost, there's momentum. So, uh, you know, this slide, I, I spoke about how gold has generated long-term positive returns in both good times and bad, right? And that is because its demand comes from a variety of sources. And, you know, that's what differentiates it from other asset classes. So definitely uh, because of its inverse correlation to equity markets, it is a risk mitigator. It is a portfolio diversifier, right? Uh, 
but in addition it can also uh, enhance returns for you uh, we saw you know how uh, an 8515 or uh, 8020 equity gold portfolio uh, you know did not compromise on returns uh, it gave as uh, as much returns as say uh, an equity portfolio uh, did and also reduced your downside risk and your you know uh, volatility of the portfolio so uh, return enhancing potential yes and uh, mitigating risk yes uh, uh, it's it's a very multifaceted asset class and uh, uh, you know uh, really meets both both those needs in a good way Thanks, Gazal. Uh, Chirak, next question to you. Uh, will it be possible that investor would lose faith in the USD like uh, GBP? That seems to be the return of gold standard pre-1973 era. So, uh, dollar, we've, we've written extensively about it and we've spoken extensively about it before. Uh, dollar as a reserve currency may stay for some more time because there is no alternative. Today, uh, if you look at uh, other currencies like Euro is struggling, Yen is struggling, GBP is struggling. So all the big currencies out there, uh, they are not in a position to kind of knock the dollar off of its reserve status. So I think uh, dollar may continue to remain because of just sheer lack of alternatives. There is no other reason why uh, if there was a credible uh, contender to the dollar, I think it we could have seen. But if you look at the faith in the dollar, is slowly been eroding. If you look at trends like dollar used as uh, 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 as trade payments made in dollar is declining. Share of reserves in dollar is declining. It's slowly slow trends, but we are seeing that trends over a period of time. So overall, I think. Uh, uh, dollar will stay with us for some more time as a reserve currency. Uh, will we return to a dollar gold standard? Uh, I I think there are I think good reasons and there is a possibility, but unlikely to go to a gold standard because of the central banking that prevails today. Uh, central banking uh, has changed course from the objective that it was. Uh, uh, it had it it, it it was it was established because uh, you see that time and again uh, there are politicians who come out and give big promises and those promises are being able to be fulfilled just because of the sheer presence of central banks. Uh, governments create debt. Debt is being bought by central banks, and central banks print money to buy that debt. So that cycle is very. Uh, settled and you know uh, liked by everyone because you know uh, politicians are able to fulfill their promises though uh, how much uh, improbable or unviable they may be uh, because but it's facilitating that unlimited debt creation so until there is a bigger crisis at hand I don't think that uh, we will emerge or move to a dollar a gold standard uh, today, gold standard is very, very possible because you can electronically store gold and you can, you know, instead of carrying gold bars, like for example, gold ETFs can be transferred from one person to the other seamlessly, right? Uh, because everything is electronic. But uh, there is unlikely that we will move to that because uh, uh, the sheer uh, political world, sheer central banking world will not allow it to happen. So, so we will not go to a gold standard unless there is a very big crisis at hand that would that we would see that will push the regime towards uh, more rationality and uh, towards a gold standard. So, both I think uh, are are the uh, probable solutions, but uh, we are not anywhere close to moving to those solutions. Thanks, Shira. Next question would be, uh, gold ETFs have an annual cost, while physical gold has a one-time cost. Why would an asset allocator not put most part of the gold allocation to physical gold if the holding period is 30 plus years? Yeah, sure. So what you have to do is uh, take that upfront cost, maybe 5 10%, right? If we even say it is 10% initial upfront cost for you to buy that physical gold, 
and you compound that with gold returns over a period of time. So 10% uh, increasing by 10% every year uh, is the cost that you will end up bearing for uh, owning. So it is still effectively, if, if that's a 10% cost and gold returns are closer to 10% that we have seen over long time periods, then effectively it's a 1% cost that you continue to bear over a period of time. And gold ETFs today are being offered around 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8% in that range. Uh, so it's still amount that amounts to a lower cost of holding. Plus it relieves you of storing the gold, physical gold. And even if you say I'll store in a bank locker, I think it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to secure or insure your bank locker. So here you're getting surety of purity, you're getting uh, uh, hassle-free storage, you're getting full comprehensive insurance, including terrorism cover. Then why not pay a smaller price, which again is a lower price than what you would have occurred by buying physical gold? So overall, I don't think that you are paying a higher cost. You also have to see what is the actual effective cost, though it may look like you're just paying it upfront, but upfront cost compounds every year because gold is giving returns every year. So if you pay 5%, 10% upfront cost, means that much gold you have not bought or lesser bought, and therefore you're missing out on those gold returns year over year. So you have to see that upfront cost compounded with gold returns over a period of time, that is your actual effective cost, which probably will be higher than the cost of gold ETF expense ratios, uh, plus plus the benefits that you get with the gold ETFs. So overall, I think still gold ETFs will have a significant edge over physical gold. Thanks, Shira. Uh, next question to you, Gadan. Uh, gold ETF saw outflows in August and inflows in September. Your views on this trend, what should be your strategy to invest in gold overall? Um, so, yes, uh, I think gold ETF as a category saw outflows uh, in July and August. Uh, so, you know, this is typical investor behavior wherein tactical investors tend to move out of gold when equity markets are doing well, which was the case in, say, July and August, right? Uh, in contrast, if you see uh, the months prior to that, March, April, May, June, gold ETF saw strong inflows, right? Uh, because equity markets were, you know, jittery that time. Now, again, in September, uh, gold ETFs have attracted flows of, you know, 300 crores plus, right? Because equity markets were down. So, I mean, you know, if volatility returns to equity markets, uh, which is likely given uh, the, you know, uh, tightening by global central banks that we're seeing and all the other reasons, uh, gold and gold ETFs could again see some renewed interest. And um, I mean, what should an investor's strategy be to invest in gold? I would say, you know, it's important that investors view gold as a strategic asset, right? Uh, instead of chasing it every time, you know, the right gets tough in equity markets. Um, so, you know, on a year-to-date basis, for uh, for instance, gold ETFs have seen inflows of close to 800 crores and 14 lakh new folios, uh, and gold is the best performing asset class. So, uh, I mean, Look at it as a strategic asset class. I think that would be uh, my advice to investors, you know, uh, as they go about investing in gold. Thanks. Uh, is there any risk in buying gold bonds through secondary markets? Uh, uh, buying is, should not be so much of a problem, right? But uh, selling, like if you if you want to. Uh, sell your bonds on the secondary market that's when it really becomes an issue because you know uh, first of all you can sell only bonds in the same tranches right so there are uh, tranches of sgbs that are announced so you need to have a buyer of the same tranche if you want to be you know able to sell and because these bonds trade at a discount you know selling becomes an issue buying uh, not so much if you you know you i'm sure you you'll get it at uh, some discount if you're buying uh, sovereign gold bonds on the secondary markets thanks uh, chirag next question to you uh, is investment in gold similar to value investing where slow and steady returns are expected uh 
just before we move to that question, uh, Neeraj, I think in yeah. the previous one where we spoke about sovereign gold bonds, right. your sovereign gold bonds, when you are trying to buy, it may appear to be a discount, but at the discounted price, you will not see much quantity uh, being available for you to make a meaningful buy. So if you want to really buy a good quantity, then you will have to increase the price and uh, it will go higher. But when it comes to selling as Gazelle alluded to, whenever you want to sell, there will be probably a sizable discount because uh, most of the, uh, in absence of natural buyers, there will be market makers who will want to buy it uh, considering their liquidity cost and hedging cost. And therefore they may trade when there is a, a big seller out there. So uh, while buying, it may appear uh, uh, at a discount, but put in a sizable quantity order, uh, I think it will be difficult to buy it at a substantial discount. But selling, probably you will be guaranteed probably a discount unless there is euphoria and there's much buying happening on sovereign gold bonds. Uh, coming to uh, gold uh, versus value investing, I think uh, gold's... Uh, role is more diversification. And uh, if you see, it will give you in, uh, inflation adjusted returns over a period of time. So we have seen it's a great store of value and it kind of uh, keeps pace with inflation. Uh, so, and in an Indian economy, uh, in an economy like India, you will always see some bout of inflation, maybe five, 7%, and there will be cycles of inflation that we'll always see given the growth uh, stance we, that we have. So uh, overall, uh, I think value investing is kind of a different thing. Uh, gold is more a diversification play. Uh, uh, and I think gold's return uh, probably will, will uh, remain uh, uh, adjusted to the real inflation that we see as opposed to the CPI inflation. Probably CPI inflation we may see over a long-term periods uh, going forward, maybe in the 5-6% range. Uh, but real cost of inflation could be around 8-9%. So probably gold should keep pace with the real uh, uh, inflation that pinches our pockets, each one of us, uh, through higher medical costs, higher education costs, uh, the real cost of living that we all bear. I think uh, it should keep pace with that and act as a true store of value uh, rather than value investing, which kind of has its own cycles uh, which does well in periods of rationality versus uh, uh, periods of euphoria. So value investing may not work well when there's a lot of froth, when there is a lot of euphoria in stock markets, uh, whereas gold should uh, should also probably may not do well during euphoria in stock market when there's a lot of risk appetite out there. Uh, but at times of inflation, high inflation, at times of high uncertainty, high uh, Turbulence in financial markets, gold should do well. Thanks, Jack. Jack, can you reiterate our 12, 20, 80 slide once again uh, and how the equity allocation is distributed on that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, 12, 20, 80 uh, is a good asset allocation strategy. It's, it's a simple formula. Don't make it complex unless and until you understand your investments. I think it's not a good investment. So 12, 20, 80 simplifies your investment journey and allows you to build that asset allocation framework that you should always have. So what it says is that 12 months of expenses kept very, very safe. This number for many investors could be higher, 24 months, 30 months, 36 months, depending on your comfort level, or depending on your cash flow visibility, depending on your incomes that you generate over a period of time. Uh, Next comes whatever money after that 12, 24, 36 months that you want should be split 80, 20, 80 into equities and 20 into gold. Gold is simple. You have good two avenues, gold ETF and quantum gold savings fund, which is a gold mutual fund, uh, both giving exposure to physical gold directly and indirectly. And the big chunk, which is the wealth generating asset, the equity asset class, uh, should be very well diversified uh, because uh, each and every style of equity investing could go through a cycle of its own. And therefore, you need to be diversified to different styles of investing. 
So what we say here, the big chunk of that 80%, 70% should be in the quantum equity fund of funds, which gives you exposure to other fund managers who are good, who are credible, who have good track record and different styles of investing that they follow. So it helps you get exposure to seven, eight, nine fund managers who have different styles of investing, who have different uh, market cap exposures, who have a good track record, uh, a consistent track record, and therefore help you to diversify your equity base. Next is 15% in the long-term equity value fund because most of the funds in the quantum equity fund of funds are non-value or all the funds are non-value. So you will have uh, flexi caps, you will have mid caps, you will have large caps, you will have focus funds, uh, but there isn't value in that. So you balance your portfolio by adding a value uh, fund exposure there. And you have the sustainable investing, which is a good way to create long-term wealth, uh, wherein they are good governed companies. Uh, they are uh, uh, kind of ESG in some way is a good valuation metric that's emerging to identify which managements will deliver over the long run. So 15% in that. So given these three styles of 70% equity fund of funds, 15% long-term equity value fund and 15% ESG fund, helps you complete your exposure from an equity market perspective and therefore help you diversify and help you uh, get into that uh, big chunk into that well generating space, but at the same time be cognizant of the risk by spreading assets into different diverse styles. So this is broadly the construct. Uh, you can tweak it either going the active way or the passive way uh, and build your asset allocation. Because asset allocation, please remember, is paramount. You need to have asset allocation. And it's very, very simple to do so by going or visiting our website and looking at this dashboard and doing it for you in a few clicks and a few minutes. Thanks, sir. My next question is, is there any self-destructive level of the dollar index after which the value of dollar will reduce as it will be partially too expensive? No, I think a higher dollar strength uh, also impacts because, uh, you know, uh, uh, it also starts impacting uh, uh, their own economy per se. So I don't know the level per se, but at some point in time, it will start importing, impacting uh, because, you know, uh, U.S. also exports a lot of high-end uh, goods, uh, especially, for example, defense, for example, uh, they kind of export a lot of uh, defense items, and that will uh, become costlier for importers, and therefore lead to impacting. Uh, so the imports will become cheaper, but their exports will become uncompetitive. And so at some point in time, again, it could lead to repercussions for their demand uh, of whatever they export. So I think uh, uh, there is no level per se, uh, and, but the much of the strength that today that we see in uh, dollar is because there is no there are problems elsewhere which are much more starker than what we see in US. And second is given the problems are much sharper, those central banks are behind the curve and US is front loading the interest rate increases. And therefore, that is leading money to go to the dollar. Uh, so whenever uh, we've seen that before as well, that uh, US moves first and other central banks follow. And whenever the other central banks are in a position to follow US interest rate increases, much of the dollar strengths uh, will become, uh, uh, will fade away. And therefore, again, lead to correction in the dollar. So probably we, as U.S. comes closer to terminal rate, there could be some more interest rate increases. But as it comes closer to terminal rate, uh, which could be around four and a half percent, four four and a half percent, then probably at that point in time, markets will price in the future, and therefore say that U.S. is done. Now other central banks may catch up and therefore lead to that dollar strength fading away. So I think we are very close to that, uh, but all will depend on what happens, how Europe is impacted from an energy market perspective, et cetera. And uh, 
uh, I think over the next few months, we should see that dollar strength fading away from every. Thanks, Shila. Uh, next question to you, Gajan. Uh, how do you compare silver ETF versus gold ETF? And where does silver find a place in an investor's portfolio? Um, so, uh, silver prices, you know, because of the metals industrial use, have a stronger relationship to economic growth. Uh, you know, uh, Chirag spoke about this earlier. And that's why silver prices generally tend to move in tandem with equities and are more volatile. In contrast, gold gets a push in times of economic distress when equities tend to suffer. So if you're looking at, you know, uh, from the portfolio diversification viewpoint, gold uh, would be a better choice uh, than silver. And um, silver, I would say investors can opt to take exposure to silver from time to time on a tactical basis after evaluating, you know, the supply and demand conditions, as well as substitution possibilities, etc. Uh, in terms of uh, the ETF, so the same uh, logic extends to that. Um, silver ETFs like gold ETFs uh, are also efficient, uh, innovative ways to invest in the underlying asset class. Uh, but if you have to see from a portfolio perspective, um, uh, retail investors are you know, better off uh, taking uh, exposure to gold you know, to capitalize on its risk-reducing uh, return-enhancing characteristics. Thanks, Rizal. Rizal, can you just reiterate on uh, what is gold ETF slide, which we've discussed in our presentation, and what is the difference between the gold ETF and physical gold? Sure. So, uh, gold ETFs, they're investment vehicles, right? Uh, they buy physical gold on your behalf. So, the investor goes to the gold ETF, pays the gold ETF money. With that money, gold ETF buys gold right so there's physical gold underlying it what what does it try to do it wants to give the investor the returns of gold right in line with the returns of physical gold now uh they are financial forms but they are backed by physical gold like i mentioned so what happens is uh when the gold etf buys the gold on behalf of the investor in return the gold etf issues units to the investor now, every unit that the investor owns is like an ownership, you know, that he has of the underlying gold. So one unit for of the quantum gold ETF uh, represents 0.01 grams of gold. So when you own one unit of quantum gold ETF, you own that much gold, right? So, uh, you know, these units are like shares, right? Uh, they are like your ownership in the underlying asset, which in this case is gold. Whenever you want to buy more, you can you know buy more units of uh, quantum gold ETF on the exchange. And if you want to sell your uh, gold, you can sell those units on the exchange, right? So this is how the setup is. Gold mutual funds, on the other hand, uh, you know they invest in the gold ETF, which in turn invests in the underlying gold, right? The difference being because gold ETF units you know are traded like shares, you need a DMAT account to invest in gold ETFs just like you need a DMAT account to invest in stocks and shares, right? Uh, if you don't want to, you know, want to open a DMAT account, you want to go the mutual fund route, there's, there are these gold funds. You give them money and, you know, with that money, they invest in gold ETFs on your behalf, which as we know, have the underlying of physical gold. So, uh, you know, gold mutual funds are just an extension of gold ETFs. They just give you a way to, you know, invest in these gold ETFs from the mutual fund route. Thanks, Rizal. In uh, Chirag, next question to you. In the unlikely scenario that at some point in time in the future, if government exchange refuses to allow liquidation of digital gold ETFs and SGB for whatsoever reason, what's the what's the hedge to mitigate such kind of risk scenario? So I wouldn't know about digital gold and sovereign gold bonds because we don't run that. Uh, mutual funds are trust. And trust are uh, are vehicles where you know it is it is an independent segregated ownership where the trust uh, or the trustees are in charge of the assets and that belongs to the investors. So in an unlikely scenario uh, where you know uh, uh, they I, I don't see a reason why they will not allow liquidation. They may not allow further buying, 
but i think liquidation should not be a problem because that is where you are not buying and you are selling gold uh, to give money back to the investors so i think firstly mutual fund that is why uh, uh, one says right you should always go with regulated vehicles uh, because regulated vehicles will uh, ensure that investor money remains safe uh, and and uh, trustees here are the people who kind of ensure that uh, investors' money is safeguarded and segregated. So overall, I think uh, from a gold ETF or gold mutual fund perspective, I don't see any issue in terms of liquidation. Uh, I and and uh, uh, government for whatever reason in any scenario they may not allow further buying. They may all they will always allow selling. So in that case, I think uh, from an investor money standpoint, I think it should be very well safeguarded. And given these are regulatory vehicles and retail investors being involved, I don't see that unlikely step being taken in, an un, in a regulated vehicle, uh, which has been has gained the trust of so many people and been invested by so many people. Uh, so I think from all the forms, I think uh, given the trust structure that mutual funds operate in, makes it really very, very safe from an investor standpoint. Thanks, sir. The next question would be, uh, we are still witnessing inflationary pressure plus erratic monsoon, will, which will hurt the farmer's income, which will reduce the purchasing power of the biggest buyer of gold in the country. Rural demand accounts for 60% of India's gold consumption. What is your forecast? So yes, uh, rural India is a big buyer of gold. Uh, and uh, yes, ha good harvest helps them or improves gold buying in India. So we'll have to see how the harvest season goes. There have been reports of uh, unseasonal rains impacting productive production in uh, northern India. Uh, so we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, much of the gold, a large quantity of gold in India is bought in South India. South and West are bigger, biggest consumers of gold. We haven't seen much disruption in those regions as yet. So probably I don't see much impact on rural buying that will happen in India. Uh, also, uh, you know, physical demand acts as a good support. So in, in absence of India today, China, Turkey, etc. are emerging as very big buyers of gold today. Uh, and India is kind of uh, a bit lagged in terms of its demand. Uh, if we see current scenario, it may improve uh, given that we are entering festive seasons. Uh, urban consumer is much better. Uh, things like real estate, IT, etc. is picking up. So if uh, uh, demand or production gets hit, it may get compensated by higher prices as well. So to, to a large extent, we don't see a significant disruption from gold buying in India. And as a gold investor, you should always remember uh, physical buying acts as a floor to gold prices. It is always the investment demand that kind of pulls prices higher. And today, what we are seeing is in the global world, uh, investment demand is likely to increase, A, because of inflationary pressures, B, because of geopolitical worries, C, because of recessionary uh, uh, aspects in the global world. So I think uh, there is a larger likelihood of investment demand coming in in a big way. And if that really comes in, we could see gold prices moving higher as factors are kind of moving in favor of gold that should help gold uh, investment demand emerge. So overall, I'm not too worried about rural. Uh, investment demand is kind of shaping up well. Uh, it's not shaping up well, but it's kind of getting to a point where we could see a return of investment demand coming in and that should help gold. Thanks, Shira. Next question to you, Gun. Uh, is selling of gold ETF units easy? Yes, uh, like I mentioned, uh, gold ETFs are extremely liquid. Units of the gold ETF are traded on the exchanges, BSC and NSC. And, um, you know, uh, they trade close to the fair price. So uh, it's very easy for someone to liquidate uh, their ETF units uh, in a quick manner uh, and in a price efficient manner. Yes. Yeah. Uh, next question regarding surging gold bond. Is surging gold bond be redeemable in the market price at maturity after eight years in addition to 2.5% interest payable annually? 
Yes, it is redeemable at market price uh, after eight years. Yes. So uh, the government uh, at that point of time, uh, based on whatever the uh, market prices are, they will be taking an average and uh, they will be uh, announcing the price uh, for the redemption. But yes, this is after, you know, for holding it for the entire eight year period. And um, yes, there is a two and a half percent annual interest that sovereign gold bonds pay. Uh, these, of course, uh, are taxed at a marginal uh, tax rate. Uh, unlike the capital gains, uh, the interest is not tax free. So the next question would be, how does quantum gold ETF compare with other gold ETFs such as Kotak or HDFC from all cell perspective? From what perspective is that? Cell perspective, cell perspective. Okay, so if, uh, I mean, if you, it's very, very liquid. If you look at the spreads, it's usually a one or two paise spread. So the spread is very, very narrow at uh, most times. Uh, we have good market makers uh, who are reputed bullion dealers and others uh, broking institutions that kind of ensure that spreads are lower. There is enough liquidity out there. Uh, but at any point in time, if you see any issues in buying or selling, you could just get in touch with us and we'll ensure that uh, there are market makers standing on the other side of the spectrum for you to buy or sell. So I, I, we have not seen, uh, there have been investors who have bought really large quantities, a few kgs of gold at one point in time, and there were no issues for them buying or selling uh, at any point. So it's very, very liquid. Uh, you will get, uh, it usually trades near the fair price at a very low spread. And if you encounter any issues, you could, uh, you could uh, get in touch with us and we will ensure uh, that uh, there is a, a counterparty for your trade. Uh, most importantly, as Ghazal has uh, spoken before, that uh, we do not time or take a call on gold, mark, gold prices. Each and every unit, whenever it's created, there is physical gold underlying to it first, and then only the units get created. Uh, we are very thorough about the quality of underlying gold. Uh, we do not compromise on insurance that we take for the gold. And probably we are the only fund house who does purity tests. So from an investor standpoint, we want to ensure that uh, there is no stone unturned. Uh, we have to deliver uh, because it's investors' hard and money been put in our fund and they are expecting uh, us to do all things necessary uh, for, for their gold holdings. So, so uh, from that perspective, from liquidity, price efficiency, purity test, et cetera, I, 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 we don't uh, compromise on any of these things. Thanks, sir. And next question would be, so Virgin Bond Fund uh, is not backed by physical gold. Therefore, how it, is it assuring the investor of redemptions at market price after holding for eight years? So it's, it's the government who has designed the product run by RBI. And the government has taken the responsibility to by saying that, you know, at maturity, whatever is the prevailing gold price, we will, we will honor that. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a sovereign... Uh, guarantee that we will honor the gold price like like for a, any any currency note we have written that you know we honor to pay this sum whatever is the amount of that currency note 10 rupee 100 rupee 500 rupees that uh, that it states that we honor to pay so and so sum whenever presented similarly on a sovereign gold bond uh, they have ensured that you know uh, we will pay the gold price on maturity so, so it's a sovereign guarantee and therefore government will pay no matter if the gold price goes to uh, 60,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakh, wherever the gold price be, uh, they will have to mature or repay the investors at that price. Thanks, Vira. Uh, one more question on uh, SGB only. After how many years the window will be enabled by the central bank for redemption spell of uh, Sovagin gold bond? So after every five years, uh, after five years of holding or uh, issuance after the issuance, uh, five years after the issuance, uh, the RBA opens the window once in a year uh, for you to go and surrender those bonds uh, or else eight years is the maturity period. So I think uh, I am not a tax expert, but uh, what we have read and uh, known about the product, if you kind of uh, 
give it back before the maturity, then you don't get the tax benefit. Um, but only on redemption at maturity, you get the tax benefit. So the window opens, but you may lose out on uh, the tax benefit if you do it before maturity. So five to eight, between five to eight years, you have that window being open. Uh, the eighth year when the bond matures, it is, uh, it is done at uh, the prevailing gold price and you get the tax benefit. Thanks, Shira. Uh, next question would be, with Diwali and wedding season nearing, will gold price in India see an uptick? So, I, I mean, uh, usually we have seen demand from India increases. Dhanteras remains the biggest gold buying day in India. But as I've said that, you know, prices are largely influenced by what happens to the global factors like dollar, like yields. Uh, so that are the major determinant of where the gold price goes. Uh, India premiums may increase because demand usually at that time of the period is higher. So if say gold usually quotes at one or $2 uh, premium to the international gold prices, at that point in time, the premiums may increase so, because the demand is high. Uh, the price trajectory is determined by global factors rather than local factors. Uh, but we have seen time and again, whenever we have seen Indian demand increase, there is usually an uptick in price. It may or may not happen this time. But in the near term, we expect prices to remain range bound, as we have said in our outlook. And uh, over medium to long term, maybe over uh, post, uh, maybe one year down the line to one to three year time frame, it should start picking up in value. So overall, uh, uh, a constructive outlook, if you have a good time horizon, which we think that it's a strategic asset and you should invest in it with a long time frame. But uh, this Diwali, I think one should go and you know increase their gold allocation if you don't have adequate exposure to gold. Thanks, Shira. Uh, there's one more question on the uh, physical check of gold. Uh, like uh, when you buy a gold on behalf, do you physically check or positive weight for positive weight, positive purity, example of MMTC, PMP, or certificate of origin is enough? So when it comes to, I think, uh, physical uh, gold that you buy, uh, I think uh, uh, you should always buy from assured uh, places. And now given that, uh, I mean, hallmarking to Pebbly, I, I'm not sure, but it's only mandatory on jewelry and not on coins and bars. So I think if you buy from a... Uh, refiner like who is LBMA accredited, probably that will be better. Uh, but I think one needs to decide because whenever you buy physical, there are markups and premiums associated with buying it. And uh, again, as the question highlights, there are purity concerns when you buy gold physically. So I think why do you want to take a chance with the money that you are buying gold from? Because uh, usually people buy and hold gold for a very long time and it shouldn't happen like 15, 20 years down the line, you come to know that what gold you have isn't pure gold. So there have been various surveys that have gone through and that have said that, you know, uh, there have been concerns on purity. It's not just that he's saying it. There are many surveys that have happened and there are various tests that have happened saying that, you know, gold is usually under carriage than what has been stated. So overall, I think if you want to buy this Diwali, I think you should prefer more efficient forms where you don't have to worry about purity and the fund house takes care of it, rather than getting into the same old tradition of buying physical, where you're not sure about the purity. So in line with this, Shiraz, uh, how do we do a purity check uh, to the quantum goal ETF? So uh, we hire a purity testing agency who has been uh, doing metals testing for ages. And we hire such a company which comes with their machines, uh, which are non-destructible, uh, which are called XRF machines that help us uh, measure the gold's purity without damaging the gold bar at all. So these are machines which will uh, test at different sides of the gold bar. 
and determine the purity of the gold bar. Uh, so that is how we do it. There are certain uh, uh, certain showrooms or certain places which have those machines installed. Uh, you could go and buy gold from there and get it tested there itself in front of you. Or, uh, and, and whenever you go to places which give you such kind of surety and the testing, usually the premiums you end up paying are much, much larger. And, and hence, uh, it becomes an expensive proposition for you. Uh, whereas we uh, have been doing purity tests, we have been giving you that price efficiency, we have been giving you that purity assurance. Uh, so I think uh, it's time to change behavior. And if it is for investment, you kind of go to efficient forms when you want to buy gold. Uh, so so there are uh, there are these professional agencies which will come to your vault where the gold is stored and will measure each and every gold bar that's held by us. And they will give us the purity measurements with a certificate uh, stating the purity against each and every gold bar. So if you go to our website or if you go and look at our annual report, we give you the entire list of gold bars that we own and what is the purity measure of each and every gold bar that we have as tested by that independent uh, 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 purity assayer. Uh, and, and that is how we kind of give you that testament that all the gold is indeed pure lying with us. Yeah, in continuation, the same investor has asked us, uh, do we further see the possibility of subdivision of milligram or unit level? No, I think we have reduced it to a significantly uh, lower denomination to enhance the affordability and regular purchases by investors. I don't see a room going from uh, lower from here because already one unit is around uh, 40, 45 rupees in today's uh, uh, gold prices. Uh, so I don't see at least uh, any time uh, we changing it further lower because this has made it very, very affordable and facilitates regular purchases by investors. Uh, so I don't see a need for doing that uh, going forward. Thanks, Sharon. So uh, we'll take the last question for the day. Uh, yeah, gold is still seen as somewhat traditional or boring asset class by the young generation. So what advice would you give them when it comes to investing in gold? So I think uh, gold is uh, significantly helpful and it's an asset against depreciating things like uh, smart gadgets that people are kind of uh, uh, used to buying in place of gold these days. So I think uh, those are not worthy propositions. It can help you, uh, I mean, if you see uh, jokingly, it kind of things that eats away your family time, whereas things like gold will bring family closer. That's what we have seen in the past. So I think uh, things like uh, gadgets are kind of distractions, whereas things like gold are real assets. So I think go for the real asset. Uh, I think what we have seen is new generation doesn't believe much into things like gold, but as things as times goes by, they kind of come back to the time tested gold. So rather than waste your time towards those punitive asset, things like gadgets, I think you should start appreciating and valuing things that are real asset that is gold as opposed to uh, learning it the hard way and coming it later, regretting that, you know, I should have allocated to gold beforehand. So, so I think uh, uh, much education is needed. I, I think uh, uh, the generation who has seen it all through, uh, it's, it's our all uh, uh, duties and obligations to the newer generation to teach them that, you know, uh, where they should put their hard-earned money towards distractions like gadgets or towards time-tested assets like gold. So with that, I think uh, uh, there will be much more sanity and, and less regret, I think. Thank you, Jira. Uh, with this, we'll end our Q&A session. Uh, any closing comments from you, Jira? No, I think uh, gold, no matter how dumb it may sound, I think gold is a must-have asset in your portfolio. Uh, it's proven time and again that it's help, helps the portfolio during times of stress. 
uh, it's like the second engine of your plane when the first engine shuts and helps you sail through and, and make that landing that you will need. So I think have an allocation to all asset class, including gold, uh, timely rebalance your portfolio. And I think uh, you can make your investment journey much simpler, much easy, and much more beneficial for your long-term wealth. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Chirag, for a valuable comment. Uh, we will soon uh, post the recorded version of this uh, seminar on YouTube, where you can view the presentations as well. Uh, to know more about 12-2080, uh, solutions will request all our listeners to visit our website that is www.quantumemc.com. Also, further for any questions to be answered, you can write to us at customercare at quantumemc.com and we will be happy to answer the same. Once again, thank you for giving for everyone to giving your valuable time. Stay safe. Happy investing to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.